Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's 10.30, so uh, let me start this event. Just make yourself comfortable. Grab a cup of coffee or whatever you will feel comfortable with. And let's get started to celebrate a citizen-led climate action. On behalf of the European Climate Pact team, I would like to welcome all our participants here in person, and of course, everyone who has joined us uh, online. Uh, I would like to, of course, welcome the Deputy Director General Jan Dusik, and of course, our speakers who are going to share uh, motivational experiences uh, with us uh, today. Uh, just let me remind you, this event is an official side event of the European Week of Regions and Cities. The event celebrates uh, examples of citizen-led climate action by European Union Climate Pact community and provides an opportunity for exchange between EU policymakers and Pact community members with experience on citizen and community engagement. Let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm Daniela from Slovakia. I'm also a Climate Pact ambassador, TV uh, reporter, and currently I've been working as a spokesperson and climate crisis advisor uh, for the Union of Towns and Cities in Slovakia, and it's my honor to be here with you and also be a part of this beautiful community. Uh, let me just briefly remind you some information about the European Climate Pact. As you already know, it's an initiative of the European Commission launched by 2020 as a part of the European Green Deal. It is a movement of people united to build a more sustainable and a resilient Europe with a goal of to become the first climate-neutral continent by 2050. Uh, Pact Immunity includes more than 800 volunteer ambassadors, over 30 partner organizations, and 27 country coordinators across the 27 EU member states. Uh, briefly about the tools for citizen engagement, this year the Pact launched a series of easy-to-use tools to encourage citizen-led climate action, where citizens are invited to share their results and their experiences uh, engagement group activities with the PACT. In the six months, over 3,000 people across the EU got involved in the citizen-led climate action. Uh, now I want to ask you if you have any question, uh, you can use, of course, uh, for online participate uh, Slido, and the hashtag is PACTXRegions. You will, of course, see that uh, on the screen. And we, of course, will have time to take some questions for the audience sitting uh, right here in person. So I guess that's it from my side for now, and I am very glad to invite Deputy Director General Jan Dusik to deliver his opening remarks. There you go. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela, and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess I should say excellencies because you're all ambassadors, and that's how uh, uh, ambassadors are uh, uh, called. Uh, but uh, I would like to say, uh, dear friends uh, of Climate Action uh, and uh, um, some colleagues from our uh, sister uh, institutions in, in the European Union, very happy to be with, uh, with you today and uh, uh, to listen in to the experiences uh, uh, that you all bring uh, around the table, and that's really the essential of, uh, of the whole purpose of, uh, of the pact, to bring together stories, to replicate them, and to, to see how, uh, how we can learn from one another, inspire one another, and, uh, uh, and uh, unite behind uh, the common purpose. Um, I'm going, uh, in my memory, I'm going back to uh, my uh, uh, youth age when uh, uh, in, uh, right after the, uh, the Velvet Revolution in uh, Czechoslovakia, that time I became engaged in, in an envir youth environmental movement, uh, that time called uh, the Brontosaurus Movement. And uh, you may recall that Brontosaurus was one of the animals that did not survive uh, uh, the changes in climate, uh, uh, but uh, the Brontosaurus Movement, as far as I know, uh, in Czechia is still uh, alive. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that uh, that reminds the connections, uh, and of course we are dealing with uh, with a man-made climate change uh, uh, to a great uh, extent, uh, and uh, we are we are trying to uh, to see how uh, how we can find solutions uh, to avoid uh, extinction of species, including the humans, uh, uh, through climate change. So uh, uh, it's not a small task. Uh, uh, concretely, it's translated. Uh, 
in the European Union into the, uh, the task uh, to decarbonize uh, uh, by 2050, and that's uh, the big, uh, big uh, mandate. The other, even bigger mandate, is uh, from uh, the UN to keep uh, one and a half degrees Celsius uh, uh, as a ceiling of the warming that uh, uh, that is considered as uh, safe operating space for humanity uh, on this planet. And uh, um, of course, there is still a lot of work to do on that. Um, that work is a work for everyone. Uh, uh, we are sitting in the, uh, in, in, the, in the building where the European Commission sits, uh, and of course uh, uh, we as a Commission have an important role. But uh, in order for this all to happen, uh, uh, this needs to trickle down to uh, uh, not only governments, but also, uh, uh, also uh, subnational authorities, regions, cities, and most importantly to citizens. Uh, uh, who need to be part of the solution, who need to find themselves as uh, being part of the solution, not being left behind, and, uh, uh, and be able to, uh, to contribute to actions, to understand uh, how to overcome the challenges, what are the, uh, what are the, the uh, uh, associated costs, but also what are the benefits of moving to uh, uh, a carbon-free uh, society which will, uh, which will handle the climate challenge. And, uh, Working with the citizens, you are all doing it, and I'm eager to, to discuss with all of you the examples uh, uh, today uh, and, uh, and to bridge uh, what is sometimes a difficult uh, political discussion uh, at the European level, uh, finding, uh, uh, finding the, the balanced uh, uh, solutions for legislation, uh, finding the right, uh, uh, the, the, the right social conditions, uh, economic conditions, uh, uh, bringing it all together. But it all, it, it all boils down to, uh, uh, to a public uh, appreciation and engagement in, uh, in, in resolving these. Uh, as you all know, uh, the EU is now turning into a new uh, policy cycle with the new Commission uh, that uh, should start working at the end of the year. Uh, but uh, as uh, President uh, Ursula von der Leyen stated, we stay the course on the 90 percent uh, uh, Objective for 2040 and decarbonization for 2050. This is uh, this is the political program. Of course, uh, on that way, uh, we still have uh, the implementation of uh, uh, the legislation that was adopted in in the last cycle, in particular the Fit for 55 and uh, the objectives to reduce uh, our emissions by 55 percent by 19 uh, sorry by 2030. So that there is a work to do on implementation. We will focus very much on that. And we will focus on uh, on further uh, policy action, both in the in the union and uh, and internationally. Uh, but really, in order for this to happen, we we, we need to uh, to engage uh, all the players. Uh, we have shown in the last uh, cycle that we were able to overcome major crises uh, and uh, stay the course. We had the, the COVID uh, pandemic. We ha we have the war uh, in Ukraine uh, on our region uh, in the, on the borders of the EU. Uh, and there's many other challenges, uh, but uh, the climate change challenge uh, stays with us, uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, we are continuing on that path. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to uh, uh, learning more about uh, the uh, pact activities and uh, how you are experiencing uh, uh, dialogue with uh, with people uh, as the ambassadors. And uh, I wish you all the best uh, in your further efforts on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Dusik. Before I pass the floor to our speakers from our PACT community, let me just briefly uh, go over the agenda for today. It's divided into two segments. First, it's going to uh, happen in a few seconds. It's showcase of citizen-led climate action by uh, the climate PACT community. And after the coffee break, it's going to be a roundtable how citizens can uh, let action help to EU's climate transition. It's going to be then hosted by... Uh, Laura in the next uh, next part. Then we are going to have a closing remarks and networking lunch for all of us to um, get together and exchange experiences. So uh, if you are ready, we can go uh, right into the other part of this program. And I'm kindly asking our uh, community members and speakers to be brief, keep uh, your time, and don't forget to turn on and then off your mics, and of course, enjoy your time for yourself. Uh, and the first uh, floor is gonna go to Martin Blockerhurst. 
European Climate Pact partner from Aurora Project. Of, uh, he's going to present in the local energy community of Art House Uni uh, University from Denmark, engaging the university community staff and students. So, Martin, uh, place is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Let me go straight in uh, to my Action um, is here. We, the citizens, can trailblaze to get to net zero carbon pollution in our personal lives and influence those around us where we work and study. We can tackle the 30% of carbon emissions you and I create when we heat and power our homes and in the transport decisions we take. That is the philosophy behind Project Aurora, an EU funded citizen science research project now running in five European countries. Aarhus University Denmark is leading the way in the consortium delivering the project objectives, setting up a legal energy community made up of university students, teachers, researchers, cooks, cleaners, maintenance engineers and friends of the university, a cohort of over 46,000 people, using the Aurora Energy Tracker app to monitor and reduce their personal carbon footprint benchmarking their performance against the Aurora Energy Labelling Scheme, and best of all, funding the installation of 98 kilowatts of renewable solar energy schemes in their university through shares issued through their energy community and offsetting the carbon gains against their own personal carbon footprint. The results are powerful and are powering change. Lower carbon emissions and energy costs for the university below current energy company prices, about 5 to 10 per cent lower. Rates of return on investment for students, cooks, cleaners, teachers, better than from your bank. Yet still more profit to the energy community to invest again and again in more schemes. Diverting and using what would have been fossil fuel profits back into the local community. Integrating the experience into the teaching curriculum of the university to create the next generation of entrepreneurs who can take ownership of the energy transition and make a difference at local level. Carbon offsets for citizen investors calculated through the Aurora Energy Tracker app to aid them on their journey to net zero carbon. And this is just the beginning. It's just one example. We have others. A partnership with the Red Cross in Avora, Portugal, illustrating how to leave no one behind as community energy schemes divert fossil fuel profits back into the community to those in greatest need. Partnerships between the Forest of Dean Municipality in the UK, UPM University Madrid and solar cooperatives in their pilot projects to deliver solar energy schemes for major public buildings across their communities. Partnerships in Ljubljana University with their student energy community as they install solar power plants on the rooftops of the buildings and integrate their approach into the university curriculum. And best of all, plans in 2025 to develop a common European citizen science approach to climate change mitigation for Europe, developed with the Stockholm Environment Institute, the European and global citizen science community, municipal representatives, and showcased on the UNEP World Environment Situation Room citizen science portal. So I call on you all to go back to your universities, go back to your municip municipalities, sweep away the doubters, replicate our approach and show what European citizens can do when we act together. Best of all, divert fossil fuel profits back into your communities by your positive actions and lower your energy costs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. I really have felt the urgency behind your words. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and now I'm passing floor to Lola Ott, also European Climate Pact Ambassador from France. Uh, she's going to present fundraising for an artificial reef in Mediterranean Sea to help restore marine biodiversity. Thank you very much, Lola. Press the button. Okay. That's it, so. Perfect. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our action. So my name is Lola and I'm one of the co-founder of Octopus, which is an organization that focuses on uh, ocean protection. We are based in Strasbourg and we try to reconnect uh, citizens with the sea. So uh, this year we 
partnered with a student organization called uh, OCEM, and together we managed to achieve a huge cleaning action because we gathered 250 uh, youngsters, and uh, it was amazing to be able to have this uh, opportunity cleaning our cities. And besides this uh, event, we managed to raise the money in order to uh, fund an artificial coral reef uh, that we built together this summer that was like 100% made out of uh, recyclable materials. Uh, and also uh, we achieved together to reconnect citizens from uh, the city with the ocean. And after this event, we are going to implement this artificial coral reef in Greece. So thanks to this uh, example, we managed to show that it was possible to take action in the city to protect our ocean, to clean our city, and to engage uh, young people in in this uh, huge um, fight that we are trying to bring in Strasbourg. Of course, we don't have the sea or the ocean here, but uh, we see that uh, there are a lot of um, people that want to take action. So I'm really happy that uh, I can present this action that shows that uh, we can together achieve big uh, action. And this artificial coral reef uh, is only the beginning of something bigger because uh, we plan on creating new reefs this uh, year. And next year is the year of the ocean because the United Nations are going to come to France. Uh, so I'm hoping that we will be able to organize more cleanup action and to create new reefs. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Great job you have done. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm passing floor to Ioana Petrescu, European Climate Ambassador from Romania. Uh, she's going to present a workshop for local stakeholders in a call region to build a common vision for the just transition. Go ahead. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me here. I'm, uh, my name is Ioana Petrescu. I run a green organization called Pursi Simplu Verde in Romania. And I'm going to tell you a very brief story about the stakeholder engagement we did part of a um, Horizon Europe project called the Just, which is meant to analyze the effects of energy transition on uh, different categories of uh, uh, firms, uh, households, uh, on, uh, on public bodies, and also to come with uh, actionable uh, results and policy recommendations. As part of, uh, of these projects, we organized uh, several stakeholder engagement. The one that I'm going to uh, briefly describe today happened in uh, Hunedoara in September. Hunedoara is a former mining area in Romania, a very poor area uh, where a lot of people lost work, where uh, there isn't uh, any more industry uh, there, where people uh, fled that, that region and left either in richer parts of Romania or, or they left for the rest of Europe. So uh, they have a lot of challenges. And uh, during three days, we got together representatives of NGOs, of youth, of unions, uh, SMEs, uh, clergy, local authorities, and uh, we discussed um, uh, we, we try to co-create uh, a vision together and some, uh, some actionable steps from their point of view. So in the first day, we discussed what, uh, how they see energy transition so far, what's the, what's the pulse uh, at, at grassroots. Then we build a vision for 2050, the way they see it for Hunedoara after they successfully went through the energy transition. And then we try to build with them a series of of, of uh, policies and, and actions that they want to see implemented. Um, and I want to say that the stories were many and, uh, and uh, the challenges uh, were many, but in the end we managed to, to extract from them certain uh, policies and ideas that we were able to implement in our modeling into the, the research, because this is a Horizon project, so it's a, it's a research project. And, um, and now in December we're going to go back with, uh, with the vision that we created and, and with the results of the preliminary modeling 
to, to them to show what we did with the, with the discussions that we had. So I would say that my takeaways from, from this experience um, are that, first of all, it's very important to, to include stakeholders in research in all stages of research, so not just at the end to give you feedback on the research. We actually um, included them before we even started the modeling to get to get an idea of what areas we should and what, what elements we should include in the research. The second one would be to have a very um, diverse set of stakeholders. Our was quite diverse, and, uh, and that actually gave us a richness uh, for our analysis much later that we would not have had just by talking with local authorities or just at NGOs, for example. And three, it's sort of this continuous engagement with them. We, we, continue, we would like to go back and, and present the final results of the, the project and, and keep in touch with them because we feel that once we deliver to the commission the, the final deliverable with the policy briefs and recommendations, uh, that's going to be much easier to be accepted at the local <laughs> level than uh, if, if we did that along the way. Um, so that, that would be sort of my, my three takeaways from, uh, from this experience. Um, I hope we can discuss more on how to, to include more and more people on these discussions that seem very technical, especially when we talk about just transition, because it's really important to have the, the people on board when, when we go ahead with, uh, with the difficult policies, especially in, in difficult and poor areas such as, uh, such as this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iona. Now I'm passing the floor to Aurora Audino, a European Climate Pact Ambassador from Belgium, presenting a peer parliament held during the G7 meeting. Aurora, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Daniela, for the floor. And uh, first of all, thank you to the DG Clima for organizing this event together with the Pact Secretariat. It's a real honor to be here today and share the experience held during the uh, G7. So I want to start with a couple of numbers. Uh, indeed, we know that 93% of uh, people in Italy want uh, stronger climate action from their leaders. And this number uh, is around 80% at global level. So this year, Italy hosted, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the presidency of the G7. And uh, back in uh, April, um, in my hometown, which is Turin, Italy, there was the Ministerial or on Climate, Energy and, and Environment. Back then, there was uh, a call of events uh, supported by the Ministry of Environment together with Connect for Climate uh, of the World Bank. And uh, for me, uh, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to bring uh, a citizen in front of decision maker to claim this uh, you know, stronger climate action. So the idea... Um, uh, was born uh, in this way and uh, what uh, what I did is that uh, together with two friends from uh, university from Polytechnic of Turin uh, which is where I studied we decided to uh, organize this event uh, this debate in collaboration with the university itself this partnership uh, was really key because uh, it allowed to really engage uh, um, a, a, a very broad range of people from different ages, so starting from youth, but also to uh, older uh, generation, as, as we say. So uh, just briefly how the event was structured, we had uh, two main sessions. In the first one, uh, we had uh, uh, an introduction with uh, high-level speakers, because of the G7, we were uh, of this G7 ministerial in the region. We were lucky uh, because high-level personalities were already there, so we didn't have to, you know, pay for their tickets or invite them. They were already in the region, so this also was an, was another um, uh, key element of this event. So we were very lucky to host and have the Minister of Environment itself. Uh, we had the special envoy of climate change, uh, but also local administrator. Also, we had international um, inspirational speeches from uh, uh, university teachers as well as uh, research centers on climate change. The second part of, the, of this debate was about uh, really putting the citizen at the center of the discussion using the peer parliament uh, um, toolkit, which is created by the, was created by the PAC Secretariat. 
we, we brought together little groups and uh, to discuss really what solution uh, they would like to see implemented at local level. So um, we discussed about uh, uh, sustainable consumption, mobility, energy, and uh, uh, youth participation, as well as citizen participation. And the minister was there until the end, so really youth and citizen could present the solution in front of uh, decision makers. So uh, I think this, uh, this was, a, a, let's say, a, a small example, but could, uh, could be replicated in, uh, in more opportunities. And uh, I think it has a lot of potential, especially because we presented some real climate solution to the decision makers. And so there is uh, really potential for scaling up and also for implementing the, the solution that we just discussed. I think if we had more resources, more time, this would have been clear. <laughs> but I stopped. <laughs> so with more, uh, more resources, I think this could be uh, scale up. Thank you. I mean that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and the climate journey, or La Ruta del Clima, is going to be presented by our another Climate Pack ambassador from Spain, Carmen Maria Perez Juan. Thank you. Hello, first of all, uh, thank you very much for organizing this event. Um, I'm very happy to be here sharing today with you all. I wrote a letter for you that I'm gonna read explaining my experience with this project. So the letter says, a few years ago when I was doing my internship for my master's degree in environmental education, I first heard about the climate journey. Me, I have always loved discovering new cities. I've been lucky enough to travel quite a bit around Europe. When I travel, I used to join free walking tours to learn about the history and secret places of those cities. It never crossed my mind to explore my own hometown through a walking tour and way less to do it from the perspective of climate change and sustainability. So I was quite surprised when I joined my first climate journey tour. The climate journey offers a different kind of experience. During the tour, I visited places in my neighborhood where I could learn and discuss about the causes, impact, and solutions related to climate change, being able to visualize it in my direct surrounding. For example, I, re I learned about local history, urban planning, greens, green spaces, and nature-based solutions. I visit local business, finding new uh, choices and connected with the community. We discuss about food security, waste management, and circular economy, among other topics. The tour ended with a group talk where we were ab able to exchange ideas and a call for citizen action for climate justice. In addition, I met new people and even made new friends. The climate journey started in 2019 in my hometown, Malaga, south of Spain, thanks to a small group of young guys who, while doing playing some sport one day at the beach, decided that it could be a great idea to make people talk and get close to climate change topics. Today, this idea has been replicated in cities such as Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, and Zaragoza. More than 65 entities have been trained to replicate the climate journey in their local cities and villages. More than 40 events have been held and an impact over 450 people of different ages and backgrounds who participated. The climate journey promotes a type of tourism based on environmental education that engage our community. Environmental education is a field full of surprises through which I got involved a few years ago as a student and through which I get to know, remember those friends I mentioned before, other climate pack ambassadors who inspired me to join this movement for climate change education and engagement, and be able to share motivating, motivating experience like the one of today. So thank you for your attention. I may see you in a climate journey work soon. Uh, local government and citizens. It's going to be presented by Joško Klisovic, European Climate Pack Ambassador from Zagreb, Croatia, 
who organized a citizen assembly. There. Thank you very much. Organized in Zagreb, as you said, that was a citizens' assembly. As a politician and former diplomat, I know it's very difficult to implement any decision or to forge and develop any policy without public support, without citizens' support. So that was then my intention for this policy, climate change policy. For all the measures we envisaged and targets in Green Deal, uh, we need to speak with our citizens and see what they think about it. Um, but, you know, in Croatia, let me say from the very beginning, there is very low culture of participatory democracy. Uh, we have envisaged different models by our constitution, regulated by our law and statute of Zagreb, but on each event, 10 to 15 citizens usually appear, and they are usually frustrated citizens who are criticizing you and shouting at you at every, every second of your dialogue. So, you know, then I was thinking how to really organize meaningful dialogue, you know, how to get uh, constructive citizens on board to discuss with us. Uh, and then in, in newspapers I saw the poll which uh, was assessing what was the trust of Croatian or Zagreb citizens in different institutions. And they say we believe 28% in European institutions. 11% in national institutions, and 4% in political parties. Hmm, <laughs> not very good. <laughs> uh, so they won't listen to us. They don't generally believe to politicians. And they developed over the centuries certain mentality, which was put in one phrase. And that phrase is, um, tie your horse when your master tells you. So in other words, you know, your voice is not important as ordinary citizens. You know, you are powerless, you know. And people are, you know, they, they feel that. You know, they feel that feeling of apathy and powerlessness. I mean, why to engage when cost-benefit analysis say it's, you know, wasting of time and energy? Right. Um, so then we, I started to think, and then I realized we need to engage European Union. People believe the European Union. Fine, excellent, let's do it. So I went to the commission. I speak to the G Klima, the G uh, Environment, and they send us a director to present the views of the commission. I'm a member of committee of the regions. So I went to the secretariat as well and asked, look people, you need to send me somebody. And they did, they did. And I said, but I need some practitioners, people who are you know, of the political cloud, wait, that our uh, citizens, we say, ooh, look, somebody is coming and it's worth hearing him, what he or she has to say. So I invited mayor of Warsaw, mayor of Budapest, mayor of, um, or deputy mayor of Bologna, a couple of, you know, big shots in, in European local administrations. Um, and that sparked the interest of media. What's going on? For the first time in Zagreb, somebody's organizing an event in the assembly of Zagreb, which is of international character on the topic which is important, which is modern, and we don't know much about it. Um, so we, you know, engage all of this to the event. And that was not enough again. And then I realized, but I'm a member of wider network called Climate Pact Network, or I'm Climate Pact Ambassador. I contacted our contact point in Zagreb, and she joined with the whole team. They really raised the substance of our discussion. They moderated the discussion in proper way. That was good, but still not, not enough. So people don't believe politicians. They believe, to a certain extent, institutions. But whom they believe to? I realized scholars, scientists, are people they believe to. So we invited scholars for creation faculties. Then trade unions. They're organizing trade unions. Let's invite them. NGOs, they're kind of consciousness of the society. Let's involve NGOs, uh, association of employers as well. So we, you know, kind of put under one roof, under the Assembly of Zagreb, all the stakeholders. And to our big surprise, big positive surprise, people did not appear, 10 to 15 of them, but 200 of them in person appeared in 
the assembly, and 400 of them were registered officially online, uh, so they participated online. So, I mean, the first obstacle was removed. We got the attention of the people. And then we started discussion. So I expected, you know, that they will shout of us, they will criticize the local administration, state administration. It will be quite heated, this debate. But no, <laughs> it was really constructive debate with all the rep uh, elected representatives, you know, so us, uh, members of the assembly, and they have separate meetings with uh, political groups so they can see the differences between the groups. Um, and that discussion uh, ended up with the concrete proposals. And now it's the second most important lessons uh, learned from the event. If you want citizens to be engaged, you need to listen, listen them honestly and to genuinely follow up on the conclusions of the dialogue. So I was the one, as the president of the city assembly and climate Park's ambassador, who put you on the agenda, official agenda of the assembly, of citizens, of not citizens, of the city assembly, uh, the proposal we agreed with the citizens on energy community. Because it's impossible in Croatia to, ha to install solar panels on, on multi, on apartment building. So where you have many apartments, many flats. You can do it only on your private house, but not on the apartment building. We realized immediately this is not just a city uh, uh, jurisdiction, but a uh, national jurisdiction. So the parliament, national parliament needs to change the law. I sent the request to my political group, to the parliament, and um, with, a, with a, it was not a request, it was really kind of a <laughs> command. <laughs> you should do it. I mean, our authority in this city depends on what you do in the parliament. And they followed up the whole thing. So we really gained the trust of the people. Uh, people realized that their voice matter. If you really follow up on the conclusions, you agreed with them. Um, and suddenly, everything changed in the way. You know, um, in this particular case, not in general, to be honest, but in this particular case. Uh, so the lessons we learned is um, involve all decision makers or opinion makers into the discussion particularly those who, uh, to whom people believe to or uh, trust to. Then, lis listen genuinely, honestly, what people have to say. This is not just pro forma. And the third, follow up on that. Success is a joint success, and people feel it's worth engaging. So these are three main, um, main lessons learned, takeaways from our uh, event. Plus, people like to be a part of the larger force. And when they see that your European Union is going that way, that we have climate pact ambassadors, you know, they want to join because they want to be part of the force, force of change. And they know uh, individually it's impossible. But as a structure, as a, you know, uh, belonging to the larger structure, and larger force, you can do it. And I think that we changed the perception on climate change in Zagreb. We immediately after uh, one month, we, um, we enacted, uh, uh, how we call it, climate city contract, which was uh, publicly debated in very positive light. So we changed the atmosphere, and that's important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It seems you're a great leader, and thank you for the energy you have brought up to, <laughs> to uh, today. Um, okay, because we do have a few minutes, I would like to kindly ask you to give your feedback to our uh, speakers, and then we are going to take some questions. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I, congratulations on uh, the great uh, examples and the diversity that, uh, uh, of actions that, uh, that you have just presented. And, uh, uh, there is a, there are several common threads in it, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I like how uh, we started with energy communities uh, uh, example from Aarhus, and then uh, we are we are uh, back uh, in Zagreb uh, from A to Z uh, actually uh, uh, to uh, to show how how all things connect, and uh, I think that's uh, that's one of the powers of uh, of this uh, uh, of, of of this community, and. Uh, 
obviously the energy transition is at the core of, uh, of uh, what we need to do and uh, uh, the engagement not being not just being part of solution but also being part of the design of those solutions uh, making citizens engaged uh, uh, not only being uh, stakeholders in the sense of uh, uh, of uh, uh, the words that uh, we usually use but really to realize these are the stakes and these can be even shares of the people in engaging in those solutions and uh, uh, I think that uh, good good examples of those and I recall that Aarhus uh, uh, is also the name of the convention uh, uh, in Europe which uh, uh, supports public participation and engagement so uh, that's also uh, another connection. The other connection uh, we heard uh, was about the uh, the linkage uh, with oceans and how uh, uh, how the river uh, river Rhine in uh, Strasbourg can uh, uh, can relate to uh, solutions for the ocean. Biodiversity needs to be part of uh, uh, of the solution. We cannot create problems to biodiversity by acting on climate and vice versa. And oceans is an important theme with important issues, but also an important part of uh, how we can uh, how we can uh, regulate. Uh, uh, carbon in the world. So I think that's uh, uh, another powerful connection. Uh, the question about uh, the social acceptability, acceptance and vulnerable communities, very important uh, uh, to, uh, to go for a really just transition, to, uh, to, to care about specific uh, vulnerable groups, uh, to, uh, to listen, to uh, co-create, to show the benefits of, uh, uh, of the transition and uh, to, to show them the way that uh, this is uh, ultimately going to be uh, in the benefit of, uh, uh, of the lives of, uh, of peoples. And uh, the citizen uh, comes from, uh, it relates to the world of city, and if we realize that 80% of the EU emissions uh, uh, come from, from cities, uh, uh, this is where the solutions uh, need to be. And the citizens are also uh, voters, they come to elections, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is where the link can be drawn all the way from, uh, uh, from G7 to, uh, to the local people uh, to make the politicians listen, re react and act and uh, be accountable when it comes uh, to the elections. And if, uh, uh, it is better that uh, the programs of the politicians are based on their engagement with, uh, uh, with the citizens and voters uh, uh, rather than their own uh, vision how they want to uh, uh, to frame uh, what they think uh, the, the, the the citizens need. So this this is this is uh, uh, very powerful. And finally, on the engagement of youth, I've started with it in my opening remarks. But uh, obviously, the youth today uh, will be the ones who will bear the, the 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 biggest impacts of climate change in the coming decades. And uh, uh, we should always have this compass. What are we? passing on to the next generations and uh, how, we, how we can enable the young people to, uh, to, to shape their future uh, together with us. Thanks again for the great examples. Thank you very much. We are pretty good following uh, our schedule and so we are ready to take questions from the audience and also from our online participants. So just feel free to raise your hands and ask questions either to uh, Mr. Dusik or to our speakers. And of course, participants who are online, we have already received several questions. So I will pass the floor to the audience here. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hands and uh, ask if you're interested in a topic. Uh, yeah, there is a... Do we have a microphone or... Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Carmen Marquez Ruiz, and I'm uh, a Spanish ambassador of the European Climate Pact. And I would like to congratulate all uh, the participants, in particular the, all the ambassadors who have uh, told us uh, what they have done in their local city, in particular Carmen, you know, who is also a Spanish ambassador, a very young Spanish ambassador. And uh, also we, in Valencia, we, we organize, now this year that the European, that Valencia is the European Green Capital, we also organized a meeting of ambassadors where we try to discuss local issues of how the municipalities uh, deal with cl the climate change uh, challenges. But I would like to ask a question. It is about um, 
the, what kind of uh, support that the Climate Pact ambassadors can get to, um, to promote and support local action in very little cities. So because I think that the, the European Commission is doing a great job in supporting local action in uh, big cities. We, we do have the EU mission on cities, and we have like 100 cities that uh, are in this uh, mission. But we still have very you know, little municipalities who are looking for support and who are also facing uh, important challenges. So in Spain, for example, we are realizing that we have to do more in order to support these uh, little uh, municipalities. And I would like to ask uh, the participants whether there is something in the pipeline or some initiative that we could also, from which we could learn in Spain. Thank you. Well, thank you for, uh, for that, and I absolutely agree that uh, uh, this is uh, not just an action from big cities, uh, that uh, uh, the action needs to, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, activated uh, in uh, all municipalities uh, and, uh, uh, and reach to as many citizens uh, as, as possible. And uh, the pact is not aimed for dealing only with the capitals or with the big cities. The, the idea is really to create a, a, create a community and to, to, to empower, to, to also see, I mean, some, some, some of the solutions, of course, are related to, uh, uh, to big projects which, uh, which need a particular funding envelope. Some, some of them can be uh, really um, voluntary or very, very low, uh, uh, low, low cost of engagement. And uh, obviously combining these with the opportunities that uh, exist uh, from uh, European Union funds or national funds to, uh, to support, uh, support subnational engagement uh, is, uh, makes a lot of, lot of sense. Uh, and that's not just for the, uh, for the big cities, but uh, uh, really to, to, uh, to ensure empowering and engagement uh, uh, all, all around Europe. Thank you. Maybe we do have some time for a reaction. There you go. Maybe, Frederick, if I can pass the floor for you and then Joschka. Okay, thank you. There is also Mark. Yes. It's just to, uh, an answer to, uh, to the question about the Climate Pact Ambassador. Sorry, I didn't, get, I didn't re record your name. Um, and about Spain. I mean, I'm representing the Covenant of Mayors uh, Office uh, in Europe. And we have, I don't have the, the exact number, but I think um, close to 2,000 towns and villages from Spain that are part of this movement since its start in 2009, and they committed to go beyond the EU climate and energy objectives. So that's not as bottom-up as the other uh, initiatives we heard today from citizens, but the, the concept, and that's an initiative of the European Commission, is to engage city administration and their politicians to make an action plan for the decarbonization, for the resilience of their territories and their communities and also, they, they have a mandate to engage their citizens into that. So we don't have the same support as the, the, the other initiative you, men, you mentioned, which is the mission for 100 climate neutral cities. But we try to pull them together, provide them a very robust framework for them to take action on, those, on, on the pillars of mitigation, adaptation, and energy poverty. And then, and then a big success in Spain is the collaboration between those towns the provinces and the regions, so what we call multi-level governance, for which Mr. Krisovic did a, a, an opinion for the community of the region, explaining that this, this is the key for the implementation of the Green Deal. We need to ensure that the different levels of administration and the cities being the closest to the citizens and to the local stakeholders can have their role and can be supported. So I'm happy to discuss about the coffee on what we can also help you to do. Yes, thank you very much. In my experience, at least three forms of assistance you can get from Climate Pact. You get their logo, put on your activity. It really sends the message you're not alone, you're part of a larger network, which is European network. Citizens like that. Financial assistance, very modest, but sometimes important. And the third one, substantial. You get information, you get data, you, have, uh, you can get analysis, which is checked and proven. It's very important. Your argument is then it's much stronger than opponents you know, who are opposing you. And then when you want to schedule a meeting in local, with local authorities or national authorities, and you say you are coming from Climate Pact, which is European Commission's initiative, you generally get the meeting. You know, otherwise, the doors will be closed. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We do have a um, question. Is it working? No, it is working. Uh, for Aurora, uh, there's a question. What advice would you give to someone interested in doing a peer parliament with authorities? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think one uh, uh, key element um, reflecting on my experience was to really find a strategic partner or initiative to be part of so that the peer parliament <coughs> itself gained more uh, value and it was easier to sell it to the authorities and to engage with them. So in my case, uh, this was this uh, call for events, official call for events before the G7 that kind of officialized the, the peer parliament. And then also, um, uh, luckily, uh, we, we received quite uh, quickly the, um, the acceptance of the invitation from the Special Envoy on Climate Change. And after that, it was so easier to receive uh, additional uh, high-level speakers, because once you have one, then it's also a matter of, uh, of presence for, uh, for uh, high-level speakers. So um, I think this, these are my, this is my tips, like find the uh, strategic initiative, strategic partners that can really add value to, to your initiative. Give them space uh, and also uh, try to uh, make it part of a process that is not just the peer parliament, but also where they can gain. What can they gain? Uh, what can the authority gain from your event? So. Uh, try to, um, to create a, a full story and, uh, where, where it's not just the event itself, but it's also, okay, maybe we can implement some solutions together. So I, I think that, and also then be very flexible because <laughs> uh, with authorities, uh, it's always hard. Uh, maybe they cancel last minute, they accept last minute. So you need some uh, flexibility in the planning. Thank you very much. Maybe another question for the audience? Yep, there you go. Maybe the lady first. <laughs> Good morning. Um, it was, it's a mix between an invitation and a, um, a remark. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone because I feel that every one of the, the actions that were presented were really interesting and very needed. Um, there's some stakeholders that I've been missing, and uh, these are the children and the schools. And so uh, the part of the invitation that I wanted to make is whenever you have uh, an event, whenever you bring actually all these stakeholders, there's plenty of ways to involve children in schools, um, either before the events, um, by asking their perceptions, and uh, or during the events. Um, for instance, we organize some uh, child voting ga um, sorry, voting games on uh, climate change where children can uh, vote and give their uh, perspective. And that's a way for everyone, especially at this age, to actually come and get the skills and the knowledge, but also share their perception. Because today uh, we have around 70% of children that are afraid about what's going to happen in the future. But we also have about that same amount that do not feel listened by decision makers, local decision makers, uh, and only 14% that believe that what they are learning today is sufficient for what comes next in the future regarding uh, sustainability. So an invitation, but also a question, were you, did you think of involving them? And if yes, how? Um, and I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. We should be very brief. So maybe... What was the question for the, uh, our participants, right, or our community members? Yeah? Um, just a very, I react? a very brief uh, response. You're absolutely right. The, the, the youth are very important, so not necessarily just children, but youth in general. And so because this, uh, in our case, were uh, discussions about just transition and policies, clearly children couldn't really be involved, but we had youth representatives, uh, and we also had the school representatives at the regional level, so in the sense of the administration of the whole uh, school system. And it is extremely important, and we heavily uh, uh, invited this category in the second day when we built the vision for 2050, because we figured <laughs> that you know these people should really, really be involved in what the vision should be. And, uh, and I'm happy to talk more on how we can engage in this type of discussion even younger children, but clearly the level needs to be 
dialed down <coughs> in terms of, of, uh, of the discussion, maybe just like building a vision that would be maybe not too technical. Uh, I think that we can, we can probably adjust that type of stakeholder engagement for younger children. Um, but thank you for your comment and suggestion. Thank you. Any short or brief reaction from uh, our community? Yeah, Aurora, go ahead. Maybe just a quick follow-up. Sorry if I'm giving <laughs> your back, but for the microphone. Um, yeah, no, actually, uh, uh, w w just wanted to share that actually after the event uh, that I organized, there were some uh, teachers participating, and actually we received a lot of interest from teachers asking this would be nice also uh, to engage uh, youth, um, not youth, but like younger people, uh, children. So I think there is really also for the peer parliament the potential to, uh, to bring it into schools, and, but just maybe need some um, uh, tailoring and some adjustment of the more technical content. Thank you very much. <coughs> Very briefly, if, you can, if I can. Yeah. In Zagreb, we have extracurriculum activity called school in community. It's not part of the regular uh, curricula. And uh, during that activity, children speak about climate change and how that affects them. We had presentation of their work in our city assembly, and I was really surprised when I saw how many projects were directly linked to climate change. So it is possible, just you need to have innovative projects and put it in schools. Because the children need structure. You need to, school, to, to speak to them uh, through the schools. Yeah, thank you. This could be a great topic for the coffee break, so feel free to join and get together then. Moving forward, we are almost uh, about to wrap up, so Mr. Dusi, if you have any final comments or feedback, just feel free to. Yes, well, thank you very much. Maybe just three points uh, in uh, concluding. Uh, first is that uh, I spoke about the new, uh, uh, new European Commission coming into office at the end of the year. And uh, one of the mandates that uh, uh, the President Ursula von der Leyen has is to make more, uh, more dialogues with citizens. So there is, a, there is an openness, there is a, there is a commitment. Uh, there's also a commitment for youth dialogues, uh, and that's a mandate that goes to all the, all the commissioners, actually, not just uh, uh, the climate one or the one responsible for youth, but all, all the commissioners are invited to, uh, to engage in these discussions. And uh, we are, uh, in the Commission, we are designing policies, but the policies are only as strong as their implementation. There was another emphasis in the programme of, uh, uh, of the Commission President that this will be an implementation commission. This is very much the case for the Fit for 55 and for the whole uh, set of climate commitments and for the others. And this uh, implementation focus uh, needs to uh, properly embed uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the addressing of the needs of people who are most vulnerable, uh, to empower them to, uh, uh, to present and offer benefits and opportunities uh, that will help to overcome the challenges. The task is big, it's not easy, it's not uh, happening overnight, but uh, we have a path, we have, uh, uh, we have clear, uh, clear steps uh, to make it happen and we need to make sure that, uh, uh, that we can engage everyone. Uh, the third point is uh, about uh, uh, anticipating and responding to the growing risks. The other mandate that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the new Commission will have is to look deeper into adaptation to climate change. This is uh, a very important leg of climate action. Uh, of course, we need to reduce the emissions uh, in the first place, but uh, we also need to, uh, uh, to engage on what, is, what are the impacts of, uh, of climate change. And this example on uh, uh, on uh, uh, linking with the tourism and making the routes uh, for understanding climate change is, uh, is, is, is part of this. And uh, we will be coming up with uh, a European uh, adaptation plan. Uh, and uh, definitely there will be more, more to be discussed uh, about uh, uh, how, to, how to respond, uh, how to be more resilient uh, uh, to, to, to climate change. So uh, it was a great pleasure for me to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, be part of this session. I encourage uh, you all to continue the conversations in the informal format, in the coffee break, in the lunch break. Uh, make the most of uh, meeting with uh, your fellows and hopefully that will, uh, uh, that, that will 
additionally charge your batteries uh, uh, with a clean energy for uh, going home and, uh, uh, and being the ambassadors uh, of uh, climate action in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much from my side as well. Now, all being said, uh, just kindly a reminder for uh, the second part of the event, which is going to be uh, hosted by Laura, how citizen engagement and participation can support the EU in reaching its climate neutrality goal by 2050, which means to build a safer and more resilient and sustainable future for all of us. So thank you very much for everything, uh, for people who are, uh, are in person here, also for our online participants. And uh, yeah, enjoy your break. And thank you for your engagement and inspiration. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. Uh, I hope you are refreshed. I've had a nice cup of coffee or tea or water or whatever it, uh, it was and are ready for the next round of discussions. So uh, my name is Laura Manavilla. I work in uh, the Climate Pact team at the Commission in uh, DG Climate Action. So uh, we work together with our Climate Pact Secretariat to organize the activities of the Pact. And also, uh, and that's the main point today, to bring the Pact community together with the bigger picture at the European level. So I'm very excited to be here because I think this is really what we want to achieve with the European Climate Pact. It's to link the climate action by citizens, by communities at the local level with the bigger European climate objectives and actions and how we are tackling these uh, challenges all together. So that's why we wanted to uh, build on the first session today with this roundtable discussion uh, where we can dig deeper on some of the topics that we already covered in the presentations and in the exchange during the first session. So the idea here is really to have a discussion around the table and uh, in, uh, in the back rows uh, by the side we have people uh, who come from the PACT community, we have some of our uh, PACT ambassadors, some of our PACT partner organizations, and then we also have people from the European institutions. So not only our team uh, in, at DG Climate Action, but also our colleagues from different departments of the European Commission. We have environment, energy, regional policy, education and culture, uh, research, and so on. And the idea is really that uh, all of the people around the table are in one way or another working on either climate action, on citizen engagement, on local initiatives, on uh, involving youth and uh, many other things. And we want to try to bring these connections to life and get them started so that we can then continue building on them in the framework of the Climate Pact, but also on uh, some of the other initiatives that are present here, here today. In the first session, we already referred, for example, to the missions or the Covenant of Mayors, and there are many others. And we really see a lot of potential in amplifying and replicating and multiplying the action uh, through the combined power of the Pact community and the various European initiatives that, uh, that you can link to. So uh, the format here will be uh, an open discussion, but with some structure. So we have invited again a couple of uh, representatives of the PACT community to share their projects to kick off the discussion. And what we propose is uh, to cover three broad themes. As we are organizing this event during the um, Regions Week, uh, we will start with looking at uh, one of the topics that was already discussed during the first session. So how can citizen-led actions and citizen engagement fit into um, climate planning and implementation at the local level, by local authorities and by regional authorities? Then from there, uh, we will move a little bit into uh, what kind of new challenges are we facing in this context? For example, uh, Jan mentioned that one of the priorities for the new mandate of the Commission will be looking uh, increasingly at how we manage climate risks. How uh, can we become more resilient? How can we better adapt to the impacts? So this, and also in general, uh, this change is a new challenge for all of us. How can we use citizen engagement to make sense of new challenges and really tackle them in a way that involves uh, everybody? And then finally, and this was also a topic that was already uh, raised in the first session, how can we involve young people and maybe also children because they are really the ones who, uh, who will live with these challenges and who need to be able to turn them into an opportunity uh, for their own lives and their own, their own future. So this is more or less uh, the, um, 
uh, the palette of, of, of themes that we would like to discuss. Um, I will invite some of you when I know that you might have something interesting to contribute, but if you feel that you have something to say, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and we will try to take in, uh, in your contributions and also the contribution from those who are following us online and uh, who will not be able to raise their hand but can send in questions through, uh, through Slido. So, um, let's uh, dive in. Uh, let's start with uh, more discussion on the interaction between citizens and local authorities. And here I would like to start with a, a little presentation by, and do I actually see our colleagues, uh, Isabel and Alexandra? Yeah, da, 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 da. Yes, Isabel, voila. Okay. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can start. So thank you very much. Yes, I will uh, speak about a project from Italy uh, of the community of ambassadors um, for the school. So uh, the name of the project is Paisk Project, Paisk uh, Young. And uh, Paisk mean in, it, in Italian mean uh, SECAP. So the project is to facilitate participation in local climate policies by Italian schools. So this is not only, uh, of course, it's an engagement project, but um, something more because it's a, a civic empowerment also, because uh, the, as you said before, and uh, it's important to support young people to advocating local climate policies using new tools. So this is a bottom-up initiative because uh, driving by young people and uh, designed specially for high school students, but also for uh, other level of schools. Um, so according to recent research of uh, youth uh, participation in policies, uh, many young people would like to participate, but they have lack uh, possibilities to participate. So uh, this, uh, therefore this was the, the aim of this project to to try to to contact the school, so we contact the school and we propose um, guides like we we have done. I don't know if you know a nudge for climate that we. So I am one of the coordinators of this project, and uh, so this project is also uh, a project not solely from ambassador, but uh, also from the University of Verona and uh, also from Indire, that uh, is my institute, so it's uh, the main uh, research institute for education in Italy. The name is Indire. And so, um, since now, we produce two, uh, three uh, guides. One is, uh, do you know what the CECAP is? The second one is, what's the climate like in your city? And the third one is, can you embrace climate complicity? So we use also the systemic uh, thinking and all. So you, you can uh, download this uh, guide from the side of Eclipa, who is the community of ambassador from Italy. And, uh, but the project is important that the, pe the young people can also uh, um, comment. Uh, so what's the, um, uh, how it's work. Um, so we uh, present, uh, we, we ask to the young people if they know the CECAP uh, uh, project of the own city, and uh, if they know, uh, don't know it, uh, to, to see, and, uh, and we, saw, uh, we show some example like Padua um, CECAP, uh, which I was recognized by the European Commission in 2021, the, the best uh, CECAP among uh, medium large European cities. But also we encourage people, uh, young people to, uh, <coughs> to contact the administrator their the cities to, to, to make a CECAP because many cities in Italy don't want to make the, the CECAP because it's complicated and they think it's complicated. So, and uh, on the, um, you, um, on the uh, our website, they can also submit a proposal from the bottom. So proposal, 
not a proposal, generic proposal, but proposal that uh, have a meaning for, for them. So a proposal that can fit uh, with their needs. So this is uh, mainly the project. I think my personal opinion that uh, the most important uh, action for climate, for climate uh, fighting is uh, to uh, reconnect, reconnect uh, young people to nature. So this is the next uh, possibility project from uh, uh, CLIPA. And uh, this is very important because, uh, as you know, uh, young people are losing the experience of nature. And this is very, very uh, an important point that I think the climate pact, uh, the climate uh, the ambassadors must uh, take uh, take care about this point and I think it's very important not only to to show young people the problem of uh, um, the problem all the problems of the world but also the the, the positive uh, the, po the positive uh, impact of nature uh, um, for us so okay this is uh, the main project uh, of uh, of the the PASC Young Project. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a nice example of both how you engage young people, but also how you link the youth engagement to the planning processes that cities have. Indeed, the, the sustainable energy and climate plan is something that cities do and that they contribute also to the covenant of mayors as part of their, their commitment. So it's an interesting example of linking the two. When you prepare those, um, uh, when you bring the um, young people to the plan or the plan to the young people, do you then uh, bring them in contact also with the local authorities? So yes, we, so we link uh, young people with the administrator and we, we ask to administrator, like uh, we will do an hackathon next month and we invite uh, people who make uh, the CEPAC and uh, to speak with the young people, uh, to explain uh, how the process and uh, all the... So we do we do this hackathon for young people. And um, so they can uh, propose something, one idea, what, one, uh, what they need, uh, and what they want to change in uh, our city. Like, I don't know, free transport or something like this. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is a, uh, a great example also from the perspective of how you have organized the activities as part of the UCLIPA Association. So for those who don't know, this is a, an initiative by uh, the Climate Pact community set up by some Climate Pact ambassadors in Italy to, to coordinate different projects. And this is, uh, this is one of them. Uh, we will hear from another one later, later on. Uh, I would like to take the other example that we uh, were thinking about in terms of uh, engagement with cities, and that would be from Alexandra from uh, Greece. And tell us a bit about how you have worked with, uh, with cities, and uh, in particular the peer parliament for urban planners that you shared with us. Uh, first of all, I believe that citizen engagement event is not just... Uh, another event, organizationally demanding event, or just an event that we have to implement successfully. I believe that citizen engagement event is about creating a community. So every citizen engagement action is an opportunity to create or expand a community. This is my approach uh, in this issue. And I always keep in mind that as humans, we need vision, we need dreams, we need each other of course, and we need hope. So uh, I consider how I'm, I will include all these elements in my planning for a citizen uh, engagement event. So I, I will share a few things uh, about the 50-minute city. It was a very successful engagement event in Greece about an issue, a topic that is not uh, very popular, although that the 50-minute city model is very popular popular in, in Europe. Uh, what we decide uh, to do, to highlight during this event, first of all, to highlight the bottom-up approach of this model. 
then uh, to highlight the social priorities. Equality in planning and involving citizens and local communities in all stages of the project. The inclusive dimension of the project. The local social interaction of the project with participation of local communities. And of course, the sense of belonging, trust and security. In other words, we try not to interpret another urban planning model, but to explain in simple words uh, all the social theories and terms, scientific terms, that this model includes and make people understand very clear the transformation uh, from the current model, I mean the model people for the city, to the future model, city for people, and of course in the frame of uh, climate change. And let me tell you what we learn from this. It's important to create narratives that are directly connected to the reality we live in, and that are and these narratives should be understandable, inspiring, and visionary for the future. And we think from now on, we should think uh, the urban resilient as linked to social resilient and well-being. This is. So, uh, if you want to, uh, to add something else about this model or this event, it was it, uh, celebrating somehow uh, we were surprised by the active participation of three deputy mayors of Attica, of the region of Attica, and many people, all, uh, all, of, all of the participants tried to, and had the opportunity to speak and express the idea about this model, the climate change, uh, how the future uh, cities will be in this framework, and I think we had some very good answers. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot for sharing. <laughs> we have um, around the table several of our colleagues from uh, the EU institution side who are working with uh, initiatives that involve local authorities. So it would be great if some of you could come in and, uh, and uh, react to Isabel and Alexandra's uh, stories or uh, share uh, from your perspective what you see as the uh, good practices or some of the challenges or some of the opportunities in terms of uh, creating these uh, connections between citizens and between uh, local authorities and, and where do you think we might be uh, going in uh, as we move along in the, in the climate journey of the cities. I don't know uh, who wants to start, but I will uh, introduce some of the colleagues who I know are working on these uh, issues. We have some colleagues from uh, our Department for Environment, uh, for example, Bettina, uh, working on, uh, on initiatives like uh, the Green Capitals and Green Leap Cities, uh, also the Green City Accord uh, with Alfonso, I think. Uh, Piotr is also from, uh, from DG Environment, working with cities, including uh, and with experience on urban mobility, which was one of the issues that you mentioned also in, in your presentations. And um, we have Frederick, who is representing the Covenant of Mayors, so a big network of cities, and with a direct link also to the, to the planning processes that you are uh, engaging on with the young people. And then, of course, we also have the Committee of the Regions, uh, I think Josko has left us, but Alexandra is here from the Committee of the Regions. So who feels the burning desire to, uh, to share? I can start if you wish. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really engaging and uh, interesting to be here and listening this uh, experience from the ground. I speak from the Committee of the Regions. We are a bit of a pe peculiar institution with the body in Brussels, but the mind spread out in cities and regions. And we feel this dichotomy every day. Because in Brussels we speak of climate transition, but there is no such thing. There are thousands of different climate transitions. And what we heard until now is exactly the living proof of this. We heard very different examples, very different experiences that were working because they were somehow matching the specificity of the specific place, the specific community. 
So how do we relate to this from Brussels and how do we support this when we have at the same time the need of setting the, the pathway, of setting the goals, bringing Europe in the same, moving in the same direction? I feel that, and we saw for example with the example of Zagreb, that local authorities can really be one of these catalysts to create, to make out of these examples a real transition pathway, make it systemic, make it systematic. But I see two things that we, I think we should still uh, reflect on. On one side, is not to be taken for granted that any city administration can organize a citizen engagement process because it's complicated. Because in some cases you need to create the culture of participation from scratch. I was myself in previous lives <laughs> trying to do this and it's completely, um, it's, it's really, really difficult because citizens in some cases don't understand why you are calling them. What do you want from them? So creating this is one challenge. So we need to empower cities and regions. And then there is the other thing that was mentioned by Yoshko, is the follow-up. Because we have a glass ceiling. Because we can discuss whatever, but then if what is discussed has no life because there is the, the national legislation that is not ready to receive what's coming bottom up, then this is a demotivating cycle where this discussion proves to be useless. And I will make a very simple example. People who know me will know what I'm speaking about. National energy and climate plans, for example, <coughs> is one piece of planning that at national level designs the climate transition in one country. But if this is not fed, by the discussions that happen on the ground, these discussions will happen less and less because they will prove to be useless. So empowering this line of command in two ways, because it's not just bottom up, it's bottom up and top down, but this is the way to make sure that this power, this bottom up energy can really become transformative. And then we can actually see the transformation because we will never see a top down systemic transformation because this is an, an internal contradiction. This is somehow I always see the thing, and I think that we're, I think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. So I agree with you, and uh, I read the national plan of uh, climate for Italy. They don't mention education, so this is the point. So we, we will start with this point, because if education is not contemplated in the plan, this is a problem. And for the other point that you said before, I think it's important also to link not only the, the, yes, the school, but not only with the curriculum. So for us, the curriculum is to um, engage also, also with the framework for the green comp, uh, framework, so the, the framework, the competencies of sustainability to uh, develop uh, competencies. And uh, so this is very important too, to develop those uh, competencies of uh, sustainability. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I saw a hand of Arvea. Can you introduce yourself? And then Alfonso. Arvea Marieni, Climate Pact Ambassador. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur uh, for digital solutions, digital twins. There is an answer whereby we could, with new digital solutions, help exactly in the engagement. There are uh, experiences of utilizing digital twins for territorial planning, whereby you can co-create in real time, allowing, for instance, citizens, you've been doing this in architecture solutions, uh, uh, inhabitants to design uh, how, for instance, the features, the technical and uh, uh, environmental features of a house complex can be done. This can be realized as well through creating spaces in, in, in districts. And where you put the KPIs into the system, climate and environmental, for instance, taking into account the presence of nature, uh, what are the uh, 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 offsetting solutions, what are the uh, negative impacts of mobilities, and you redesign that with a centralized system, you will find an optimization. And this is a very useful tool. Uh, we are talking to uh, municipalities, uh, we serve them uh, in France, we are a French company, and uh, we do have a high 
uh, interest from the political level, the decision maker, because they see that they got an advantage. They can see what it's going to be like and they see the reaction of people. How do I make it like walkers only uh, in the centers and what is the advantage for these people? And the people feel engaged. Mm, thank you. I, um, I will work um, in, uh, in the Commission in DG Environment with uh, initiatives also related to, to environment uh, in the cities. No? So it's uh, difficult to help the mayors know what is there for them and so on. And uh, when, what we have realized is that most of the cities that are participating in our initiatives, Green Capital or Green City Accord, they all claim to work with citizens. To which extent is this really happening? No? That's uh, the, first, uh, the first question. And, um, and the second one is something I wanted to address. It's a question that I wanted to ask before and I got to reply in the coffee sometimes. Is that, uh, is that the, the climate uh, and the, the commitment of the citizens for climate uh, may look like something abstract or far away or simply that uh, mitigation or adaptation is far from their reach in their day-to-day -day actions, in their, cho in their consumer choices, for example. But the, the, when it comes to environment, it's, it's much, much easier because they know that they are affected by environmental noise. They know that they are affected by air quality issues. Uh, they know that they want more green in their areas. And all this has a direct impact on climate. And also, uh, we have to go to give the voice to, to the health also, the health issues. Uh, because the, we, when, uh, when it comes to heat waves, when it comes to, well, the, I know the observatories of climate change, for example, of the Pyrenees, they work very much on, on health because it was very important for, for them. And then the, these hooks are, are very important, uh, above all, in a context of, of negative spin against environmental policies or public contest of, of the Green Deal, which we have seen in the European parliamentary elections uh, in May. So... Um, the, I have said the, the, the problems we have found, but also the good thing is that the city has the holistic vision and, they, and, and then in the end of the day, all comes together. And we find that the same people are working in climate and they are working in environment. So it's hand to hand. And third message about youth. We are very interested in, in mobilizing youth for, for environmental action and for climate action. So I think this, this mandate could be a good opportunity to, to create something. Uh, we would like our green capitals, for example, to get involved in a first cluster of exchange of young people for, for, to organize their, their climate capitality, for example. There are other initiatives, and, and that's also something I want to lay on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the testimonies and, and also this mention to the, uh, to the planning. Um, that the, so the sustainable energy climate action plan that through the covenant of mayors we're trying to support cities to do. And what is important to remind is that um, when we talk about the competence of a local authority, <coughs> what they can impact locally on their community is around 5% of the greenhouse gas emissions. They're in charge of public transport. They normally are the owners of public buildings, hospitals, schools, but that counts for 5%. The rest is us citizens, SMEs, and so on, moving with our cars. So, I mean, a SECAP and, and with the EU ambition um, of climate neutrality by 2050 can only be successful if we engage the citizens and if we provide, uh, as Alessandra mentioned, the tools to those local uh, authorities, the, particularly the small and medium one, to engage. And that's not an easy task. And, and again, um, you probably see the trend, uh, public budget are cut. So mayors are facing difficulty to hire people that have such competences, although it's, it's key. And just one example, we heard a lot of already this morning about citizens' assembly. Uh, there was one in my country, France also, that unfortunately there was no follow-up on the actions, which completely killed the concept. But if we look at some experiences in cities, Grenoble and others in other countries, of course. This is where we always see citizens, although they come from different backgrounds, coming up with higher ambition that what a government, whether it's local, regional, or, or national, would do. 
So, because they, they understand the risk they are having for themselves and for their children. And they are not uh, influenced by, by the lobby, which is another big key actor of all those policies, of course. So we need to equip cities with that to push them, to push the ambition up. We need those citizens' grassroots initiative to take action. And we heard a lot also about uh, energy community. And again, the EU has set legislation to, to provide cities with the, the possibility to do so and, that's in, and, and communities to do so. So that's very important. Another very important element of having this um, combination of citizens, SMEs, industry, local leaders taking a commitment is what um, a former ambassador of the Climate Pact, uh, Mohamed Ridwani, who is the mayor of Leuven, and Leuven is one of the leading cities in terms of transition, ecological transition. They've been ticking all the boxes of the green leaf and, and everything. He called that de-risking leadership. De-risking leadership. What he means is that if he's the only one saying, OK, we need to go climate neutral, he would have all the lobbyists, all the industry, all the citizens who want to move with their car in the city complaining. If there is a, a strong population with the same vision and the same ambition, is de-risking his position. He can go very boldly on saying, OK, we need to remove cars from the city. And he can face the, uh, the, the criticism of, again, all those that, are, that, want to, that, that don't want to change the system because it makes them uh, richer or, or happier. So again, we need to build those relations. We need to support that. Um, there are good experience of those citizens' assembly, local debate that we heard today but you really need to spread this uh, across all the municipalities in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ula, I will uh, take Piotr and Daphne, and uh, then we'll see where we are in terms of our timing. Thank you. Um, I'm from the DG Environment, uh, dealing with Green City Accord, uh, Green uh, uh, capital Awards and Green Leaf Awards with my colleagues here, Alphonse and Bettina. Uh, but I wanted to quickly touch upon one aspect that was mentioned uh, by Frederic and also before, uh, namely transport and mobility, which is quite often nowadays uh, one of the mon most contentious issues in the cities and also the big contributing factor to the CO2 emissions. Huh? So transport is the only sector where the emissions are not falling. Um, and this is partly because it's very difficult to do a behavioral change. Huh? Uh, people um, are very opposed, are often opposed uh, to something that is imposed upon them. So I wanted just to share some examples of some successful uh, measures uh, we have came up with um, uh, as the European Commission. I was before working on urban mobility uh, and we have a nice concept of sustainable urban mobility plan uh, or sustainable mobility planning. Um, which is, I would say, similar to what is happening in climate and energy planning, but for uh, transport and mobility. And the uh, key component of this concept is actually citizen engagement. Huh? Uh, we have uh, produced, uh, together with the communities or the stakeholders and, and cities, uh, so-called SUMP guidelines, with 12 steps how to properly uh, design, implement, and evaluate the sustainable urban mobility plan and basically citizens appear there in numerous places, uh, starting from mobilization, then when the decision to prepare a SUMP is taken, uh, then going through the identifying, identifying important problems with them, with citizens, discussing possible future scenarios, uh, co-creating common vision, etc., etc. So it's important to do it properly and not only as an exercise that will end up in a drawer. Uh, and, and this was also, I think, mentioned here, to have there not only the usual suspects uh, or those that are most vocal, uh, which are often so-called stereotypically speaking uh, angry white men in their cars, but to have all the groups of the population, including Kiev, uh, uh, as one uh, wise person once said, if you design a city for children, it will be designed for, for everybody. Yeah? So uh, my message would be uh, to, um, for the city representatives and for, for everybody else, uh, to, to use this uh, concept of SUMP and do it properly and not be afraid to experiment. And for that, we have another nice campaign, uh, European Mobility Week, which is exactly working on the behavioral aspects uh, where cities can test with citizens 
for instance, how it would feel like if we close one street for a traffic for one week or one month. Uh, you know, initially there is a lot of opposition. Everybody says, oh no, uh, I will not be able to go to my shop or the business will close down, whatever. Um, however, after this test period, uh, like 90% of people, they just want to continue. So European Mobility Week, another great uh, opportunity to test it, uh, including with its famous uh, Car Free Day, which in Brussels is, I think, uh, yeah, the best day in the year. Um, so voila, that would be my two, two points to add. Thank you. Thank you, Potter. Daphne, quick. Okay, it's working. So I'm Daphne, I work for DG Education, uh, Youth, Sports and Culture, and I've been a sponge since the mo this morning absorbing what everybody's saying. I said, oh yes, this, and making links with pretty much everyone. So I could speak for an hour, I will try to, <laughs> I will try to be really short. So I heard uh, many things. I heard um, we need tools for local authorities to engage. We need more resources. This morning you said, I think it was Aurora, we need more resources. So we need more tools for local authorities to engage. And we also need more tools for young people to engage. Um, I heard you talking about sustainable uh, mobility. It's also something that we are working on. And I've been working in this field for 14 years. And I guess what I want to bring now is a bit of a message of hope and and commitment uh, from uh, what that I see from the institutions to work increasingly with young people, bring more and more opportunities. Our unit has been growing and growing, uh, not just on the policy side. We have many, uh, many ways that we are now engaging young people. We had the European Year of Youth. We, had Euro we have European Youth Weeks. We have the EU Youth Dialogue, which engaged directly young people uh, with presidencies. I mean, I will not go into details, but we, we have increasing uh, uh, tools to um, to engage young people and of course from our programs Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps uh, green there's a strong green dimension in fact it's one of the four horizontal priorities so if a project is presented and has a green dimension it has priority to be funded uh, young people um, I mean uh, we, we work there's a partnership with the Council of Europe uh, that, that they are working with researchers and there's a growing eco anxiety among among young people, I mean, we know it, all research uh, show it, and one of the main things that we can do is uh, to, to help this trend is really to uh, give young people more tools and more ways to take actions. And via, I believe, via Erasmus Plus and the European Solidarity Corps, we see that there's a lot of potential still, and I'm sure some of the PACT ambassadors who talked this morning have received a fund, have, have uh, worked on projects that received funding. I'm thinking about volunteering uh, in the field of climate action via the European Solidarity Corps, but also participation activities that may be less known. It's with uh, the Erasmus Plus program, and it allows young people to directly voice their concerns and um, engage with local authorities, for example. They can work, they can set up a project via an, organ an organization, or they can, between them, decide to set up a project, meet with local authorities, to, to work really with the local level. So what, what I see is, that, and I talk, before coming here, I talked with my colleagues of the program team this morning. They said, oh yeah, funding keeps increasing. They, all, they always say it's going to decrease. But over the years, when you look, it goes like that. So I think it's really great. And I think we, uh, we, it concerns us all. And I think, um, yes, so I'm, I'm very happy to, to be part of this. And um, we're a team of very motivated people. And we keep on looking for ways to engage young people. And um, I will finish with this. Uh, we are in the middle of the Discover EU application round. So it's um, an, act, um, an action of um, the Erasmus Plus program. It's still relatively new. And we have increasing numbers of young people that apply each year. It's for young people to travel by rail within the EU. It's to really encourage young people to embrace sustainable travel. We have over 1.4 million of applicants in only five years of implementation. So we also try to keep on make the budget growing. And when they come back of their experience, we send them a survey. And over 93% of them say that after the experience with Discover EU, they want to uh, travel more by rail within the EU. So it's really also about inspiring uh, everybody to, to change our habits. And uh, so we, we keep on all working together in that direction. And I thank 
all the Climate Pact ambassadors from this morning because I thought it was really great to hear that and to feel part of this community, even if I'm on the other side of uh, the spectrum maybe, but I feel like we're really in it together and I think that that's really great. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you for the message of hope and the message of uh, enthusiasm that we are getting from young people. We also have a couple of examples from uh, packed uh, community initiatives dealing with young people. I will leave them to the end to keep this another glimmer of hope uh, to the very end. But before we go there, uh, I would like to uh, come back to some of the um, sort of new challenges that we are facing. We were talking about... Um, <coughs> not only the challenges of the transition to reach our climate objectives in terms of the emissions reduction, but also the new challenges that come with uh, the growing impacts of climate change. Because this is becoming more and more concrete. This is closer and closer to our everyday lives, our health, as Alfonso mentioned, our homes, our security, our safety. So um, what we wanted to explore is also how can engaging with citizens directly help address these uh, challenging and sometimes even difficult issues. And the first example we'd like to share is, uh, is from Italy uh, with Gianni, who with the Euclipa, uh, that I will give you a little introduction, that uh, works on an issue that sounds super interesting because you are dealing with internal migration within Italy that's related to climate change. So tell us more. Thank you to invite me here. And in fact, I speak about uh, the people engaged self-engaged. Uh, the topic I would like to, to introduce uh, concerns a phenomenon that is going to grow in the next years. The spontaneous movement of citizens from city to mountain area as adaptation action. Last year, a group of Italian ambassadors and citizens uh, at Clipa carried out a researcher uh, named Miklimi uh, that will have published a book uh, uh, to investigate uh, this movement, focusing uh, the city of Milan and Turin, this research received uh, financial support by uh, uh, important Italian bank foundation. Uh, I will spend a few words on this research as an uh, introduction of uh, the follow-up uh, experience of Living Lab uh, uh, that we have sub subsequently uh, organized. Uh, in other terms, uh, the Miklimi was the first step of a uh, probably, we hope, uh, a sequence of uh, uh, the other step uh, to go in deep of this uh, phenomenon. Um, and uh, we have uh, involved, uh, the project is uh, uh, carried out in this, is, uh, this moment, uh, uh, carried out two uh, group of citizens located in the two Piemont and Lombardy village. The Mikimi project highlighted the existence of internal migration in the Po Valley, uh, metropolitan era. What, what we have now to investigate uh, is the overall entity of the phenomenon of climate change related uh, migration within the European region. McLeamy has investigated three main aspects of the phenomenon. The first is the development of potential mobility indicator, uh, static statistically um, uh, built. The identification of differentiated mobility based on 2,200 uh, uh, interviews. And third, a comprehension of the complexity of the phenomenon and the potential challenge concerning the reception of the newcomers in mountain region. That is very important because uh, uh, um, mountain don't can accept all the people because mount, mount, the, the, you can imagine. <laughs> anyway. The result showed that uh, about uh, the 80% of about uh, 220 um, citizens that moved uh, uh, um, from uh, Turin and Milan to the other part of, of Italy, uh, the 8%, about 8,000 uh, um, people, um, had already moved to mountain areas between 300 to 700 meters. While the answer of the questionnaires indicated a strong propensity to move about 30% of the interview. In other words, more or less 10% have moved, and about 30% are uh, starting or are, have, have an idea to move. The following up of Niklimi is named uh, Futuri Dentro, uh, Future Inside, 
currently in progress, the aim to support citizens and local administrators to face the risk and the opportunities related to climate change internal migration. The question is, what role will climate change play in shaping mountain community in the next 10 years? This is a question of, of, of Futuri Dentro is trying to answer. The project uh, will allow the communities involved to be un accompanied in uh, reflecting on their future and to elaborate a collective narrative with respect to the phenomenon of internal migration. The central themes that will be addressed are the adaptation of community in fragile areas, the reception inclusion of new inhabitants, and present a future critical issue to be addressed in innovative and sustainable ways. Finally, the result described, uh, described the required tension when dealing with the climate transition, because uh, they can impact the policy needed to govern it. Thank you. Thank you, Gianni. I think it's, it's a very interesting example of how uh, our changing physical reality also has an impact on the social reality and the consequences of, of as you say, how, how communities welcome new people, how do you shape the interactions, so it's, uh, it, it links to all aspects of, uh, of the human life, actually. Um, maybe colleagues who could react uh, in this area could be Irene, who works on a mission on adaptation to climate change with, uh, what, I think around 300 regions from across Europe involved in improving their uh, resilience to the impacts of climate change. And another colleague I was thinking about is Borut from the JRC, the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, who works on the new European Bauhaus, where we are also looking at the interaction between people and places and sustainability inclusion. So, would you like to start, Irene? Yes, thank you. Indeed, under the mission, we work with a group of pioneer regions, cities and local authorities, not just region, really also local level. Um, they have committed to work on improving the resilience of their territories by 2030 or towards an objective of 2030. And they are just a pioneer group because I think uh, Frederick already touched before on the fact that anyhow, Many more are trying to, help, to work on both mitigation and adaptation by 2050 with the help and the support of the Covenant of Mayors. So we're really trying to help and really look with the pioneers on how we help them to prepare their territories. And I think it, all, it really starts with understanding what are the climate risks that they face today, but even more what they're going to face in this acceleration of uh, climate happening on the ground. So indeed, we have territories who are trying to now, to re I mean, they are now realizing that the level of the sea is rising. So if there are coastal cities, they have areas where indeed they need to probably decide what to do with the population that live close to the coast. Or there are other places which are turning very, very warm, so they need to decide what to do with these uh, high temperatures coming in the future. So we help those um, local authorities by, first of all, understanding the climate risk that they face today. Second, developing the plans on, okay, now that we know what we're going to face, how do we prepare for that? And finally, start to put some solutions on the ground. From the moment they understand the risk, and there is a lot of scientific support needed and a, a standard way of looking at risk, but to the moment of designing the plan, they need to involve their citizens and the local actors, the stakeholders, because it's you know a plan otherwise will be very difficult to execute and to actually put into some implementation if there is not buy-in. So indeed, we do support also very much the citizen engagement part of uh, the local and regional authorities trying to discuss with the local, um, as I said, citizen actors on how to develop those plans, what are the options on the table, and what are the very difficult choices. I mean, it's, uh, you know, after the flooding happen, do, should they rebuild close to the river, or should they leave that space for the river? And should they move the buildings or maybe the buildings that were there to help the people who used to live there go and get to move and, you know, start to live somewhere else? We have developed a do-it-yourself manual, which uh, is actually intended for the region and the local authorities to speak to the, I mean, do-it-yourself manual for citizen engagement. I should have said the entire title, which is actually helping the region and the local authorities to engage mm -hmm. with the citizen 
at the different moments on uh, indeed understanding the risk, developing those plans and finally implementing some action. We do have some um, financial support also help helping the region and the local authorities to create <coughs> some of those events with the help of, whenever we can, the local climate park ambassadors. It proved to be very effective. It proved to be because they have already a network, they already are into the team, and uh, they, they can really mobilize uh, uh, the, the discussion. But indeed, then it goes, and I think it was said a number of times before, to then what? So you know, once the, the local authority have developed those plans, then it's also a question of executing some of those projects. So we also have some financial support, finally, for helping the regions and the local authorities just to get it started. I mean, the amount of the investment is huge, so clearly it's not sufficient, the budget we have available, but we are trying also to help them to go and knock on the door of the banks and knock on the door of the investors. Again, this is for the region and the local authorities, but they will never be able to execute their plans if they don't bring their citizens and their stakeholders through the process. So this is also where we try to help. Yeah, maybe if I uh, build on this. So uh, the Bauhaus does not offer one solution, um, but I think it's already clear that we don't have one solution and then we don't have one size fits all. But what the Bauhaus actually offers is a framework to, to develop this solution. Solution. So the framework is um, uh, framed by three values. Uh, the sustainability, we all know, inclusion also. It brings in the element of beauty, the aesthetics, in, uh, which caused a, a bit of a rumble around, but aesthetics not as the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but more we speak about the quality of the experience. What, this, what does this mean for us and for, for uh, our uh, colleagues, citizens, but also other species to, to cohabit? Why is say other species? Because through the projects that have been supported uh, through nine different programs in the last three years, some of them are actually dealing also with what is the role of species in the climate transition. Uh, should we have species assemblies? Should we go beyond just uh, the participation of citizens and people uh, in, uh, in these matters? Uh, the second three uh, uh, principles that, that also uh, and, um, uh, encircle the Bauhaus around are participatory approach, multi-level governance, and transdisciplinarity. From hearing the examples from the Climate Pact ambassadors, um, also colleagues from the Commission, I think all of this addresses the, the uh, the, the key elements needed to come up with solutions that feed the specific area. Because that, that, that is where I think the devil lies in the details, right? And something that, that works, uh, let's say, in Leuven, in Belgium, doesn't work in my hometown in Slovenia, uh, of course. And what Bauhaus brings there is the, the model to uh, address this, but not by, again, redeveloping all of the tools, uh, the toolkits, but, uh, but offering... Um, offering a context to bring the communities, the existing tools, the existing, existing uh, initiative, uh, initiatives together. And I think also it's important, again, devil in the details, to uh, set a focus, what do we want? So in the Bauhaus, we have the participatory approach as a basic, uh, one of the basic principles. But inside the participatory approach, we uh, talk about three different dimensions. We talk about consulting as ambition number one. We talk about co-developing as ambition number two. And the highest ambition would be to self-govern. So also when speaking about the citizen engagement, we're speaking about uh, also this co-responsibility between different parts of the society, we also need to be ready if we speak from the, uh, let's say from, from the institution side, to give up some of the power and give it to the hands to the people. Because it's not only uh, the participation in, terms, uh, in sense of the dialogue, but it's also participation, co-participation in, in terms of the action. Um, so Bauhaus is exploring these avenues throughout uh, various projects on very different levels. When we speak about the EU, the, the European Commission has mobilized almost 400 million in the last three years, supporting uh, 26 demonstrator and pilot projects that uh, are present in 24 member states. And if I, we just look into the future, so based on what we've learned in the last three years and how we work with our community that has more than 1,500 organizations uh, uh, being a part of it, and hopefully after this event some more will join. Um, uh, is, uh, there, is a develop, there, there is an app facility, a new tool coming between 25 and 27, in, focusing on transformation of neighborhoods through inclusive and sustainable design. 
Uh, the program will be accompanied uh, by financial means under the Horizon Europe and uh, also uh, on the implementation side for the rollout. So cohesion funds, Life Plus, hopefully also Erasmus Plus. Some details are still to be discussed. But just to, uh, to also answer to one of the, I think it was in one of the debates, was uh, also the call for greater support. These, these kind of uh, tools that the European Commission is developing are there for you to, to use it. And we are more than happy also to engage further on to better understand what are the needs and how can we adapt better the existing tools or the existing initiatives? Thanks. Thank you, indeed. There's a lot of different programs. Daphne mentioned some for uh, Erasmus, uh, Horizon, Life, and many different programs. We try to uh, promote these opportunities to the PACT community as well, but indeed we, uh, this is one of the areas where I think we would all like to work together to really make sure that the opportunities are there for those who need them. Daphne, uh, no, sorry, Gaetan, did you want to come in? Yes, um, well, thank you so much uh, for organizing this uh, event because it's, it's very, very interesting to hear um, all what's happening on citizen engagement, citizen engagement and uh, climate, citizen engagement in transport and youth, etc. Um, I come from DG Communication from uh, the sector that actually works on citizen engagement itself. <laughs> so it's extremely interesting to hear all of that and to see how we can create uh, synergies between all these actions because uh, our aim is actually to mainstream citizen engagement across the European Commission, try to have a consistent approach. We, we um, work on a corporate guidebook on citizen engagement and I'm, I'm very happy to share that we are in a very fruitful uh, period for citizen engagement because uh, thanks to the Conference of the Future of Europe and many uh, democratic innovation and experiments that have taken place at EU level in the past year, we now have really clear mandates, and I don't know if you have read and know by heart, by now the mission letters of the commissioner designates, but we have a specific paragraph now on citizen participation and how to truly instill, instill a true uh, culture of citizen participation with a specific mention of one of our flagship uh, format for citizen engagement that we have been testing in, in the past years and successfully testing, um, which are the European citizens panels. So <coughs> these randomly selected pan-EU assemblies that we organize now every year, uh, around three, four of them, on different issues. So the, the, the two latest, one was one on energy efficiency, the other one on tackling hatred in society. Um, and uh, we know also, and I would like to uh, emphasize that because it's a tool that, that can be used on, on many topics as well, we now also have a citizen engagement platform uh, in all languages to uh, accompany also this participatory process because as we use random selection, we know that it only affects uh, the people who are participating and have the luck to be randomly selected because usually they, they love the experience. It's a life-transforming experience for them. And so we wanted to open the debates that we launched through these uh, participatory processes, uh, um, uh, launch a debate on the platform so that other people can connect, can contribute uh, to these uh, citizens' deliberation. And uh, hearing all of you here, I just wanted to share with you uh, a few ideas on how we, we can all uh, improve uh, the way we do citizen engagement at any level. And uh, because hearing what you, you, you all said, I think we always need to ask ourselves three questions when we go into citizen engagement. First is, who is involved? And the who is something that somehow, I don't know why, we always keep uh, as, as a secondary issue when it is the key issue. If we are talking about citizen engagement, it's about citizens. It's about people who normally don't have an easy access to institutions and to participation. So this is why we use random selection for the Pan-EU Citizen Assembly, because it's a powerful tool. There are other ways to engage with citizens who are more distant from institutions, but it's a key element. Uh, second, uh, of course, is the how. How we, do we engage? And I think many of you have shared example where the moderation, the facilitation, the method that you use is extremely important, that people feel they have a say and that it's on, not dominated by those who usually speak very loudly. And the third, and I think it was our colleague from Zagreb who mentioned it, which is extremely important, is the issue of what is this for? Citizens will feel that the engagement is worthwhile if they feel something will be done with their input. 
And it doesn't have to be a revolutionary impact, you know, it can be following up on some of the recommendation or simply uh, being transparent on what happens afterwards, but it has to be clear what it is for if we want citizens to keep engaging. Um, and finally, one thing I wanted to uh, share with you is we are increasingly reflecting and that's why I was so happy to hear about all these local stories because we need to connect the different level of citizen engagement. Um, we do things at pan-EU level. We would like that people hear, ab hear about it at local level. We would like that also maybe similar local events happen at the same time and that people feel that they can impact not only their local level but that some of them, uh, you know, somebody who looks like them was actually randomly selected to talk about that also at pan-EU level and that is not disconnected. And especially on issues like climate, if we don't manage to make people understand that their citizenship is multiple and that they can impact every single level that matters for climate change, uh, I don't think we would have succeeded also our engagement um, efforts. And I'd be very happy to hear of anyone who would like to connect a bit more with what we do at, at PAN-EU level. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot indeed. This mission of connecting the different levels is also at the core of the Climate Pact. Uh, quickly, Joanna, and then we will move to Sarah and Antonis. Thank you. I have a question for Irene. Thank you so much for, for your intervention. Um, so um, the, the problem that I saw was that a lot of local authorities would not like to engage in adoption. Adop uh, it, uh, it would basically be much easier, let's say, you have uh, a lot of floods year after year, and you pay those people to rebuild, and you do this year after year. And we can go into a long discussion of why politicians might choose that route rather than talk to you or to people who understand uh, uh, how, how else this could be done. So my question for you is, like, what tools can we get to convince the local authorities that there is also another way, not just this one, that maybe pays political benefits in the short run, but obviously in the long run does not benefit those people who get flood after flood after flood. And, and I'm, I'm happy to engage with you after this discussion as well and, and more because I think this is a, a problem that costs people, taxpayers a lot, and people who are being affected by this flood a lot because there is a sort of myopia from the politicians. Maybe just a quick reply. I think it's not what we are hearing from the mayors and the delegation of mayors who are coming and visiting us. It seems that they have a pressing need after a, de a disaster, let's say, happens in their territory to make sure that they protect their people and the local economy to avoid that this comes again. It's true that the people in the immediate are asking for money and compensation, but because the money and the compensation is never enough, and probably even with all the money of this world, people will not be happy that they lost maybe all their memories or not the things they had in their cellars. So there is this uh, different approach on how can they help people to be the people or the, their house of the people to be prepared for what is gonna come in the future. And that the point then comes on, it's clear that it requires a lot of money. And then the question is who invests on that money? In some places where there are discussion about is it enough again to ensure personal belongings and the proper house, but again, Probably the citizens and people are not simply happy that, okay, something happens, someone will pay me back, but I lost my house again and I lost my belongings. So I think, you know, we are, it will be interesting to understand whether indeed the pressing need of the people or of the people who vote finally on the local ground are actually protect the people and protect their economies and the prosperity rather than give us some money back after. Uh, just a quick comment and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, I think it's a biased sample, the one that come to you. The ones that I'm talking about, they will not come to you to discuss. So we can, we can follow up this later. Thank you. Thanks, great. Let's continue the exchange indeed. I think this is one of the big challenges that will be with us with the, in the coming years. Another big challenge, of course, is uh, the future. And let's move on to the future generations and uh, um, how uh, we have already had examples of engaging with young people. We have two more, one from uh, Cyprus and one from Denmark. So maybe I would like to invite Antonis, who represents one of our PACT partner organizations, who work with young people on climate and environmental issues. Tell us more about what you do. 
Thank you so much. Uh, at first, I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to be here and to speak and to give my perspective and my voice about Climate Pact Partner. So, dear Climate Pact Partners, my name is Antonis Nicolaidis and I come from Cyprus. I represent my organization called Plan B, Planet B It. We mostly work with young people aged between 18 and 30 years old and our main focus, our main field, is environmental and sustainability Erasmus Plus projects, entrepreneurship, exchange of culture, and of course promoting EU values. I would like you to briefly present one of our projects that I would say has the most impact and is directly related to the youth and how can youth participate in this climate pact and climate change. So our, call, our project is called GreenDex. Uh, it's a key action two project, strategically partnership. And this project aims to communicate to young people and youth workers ecological and green and sustainable habits, and as well bring awareness about carbon footprint in our lives. The name again is GreenDex. So what is exactly? So the idea is to create a calculator for the carbon fiber, carbon footprint of Erasmus plus mobility activities. This calculator uh, has some factors that determines how many uh, carbon footprint we produce during our Erasmus plus mobility project. The main factors are type of transportation, airplane or green travel, the distance covered, the type of accommodation, if it's a hostel, hotel, and food consumption, if it's vegan food, vegetarian, or so on and so forth. And the most important as well is the type of energy used during our mobilities. Is it green energy? Is it conventional? Is it renewable energy? So each participant in our project does this calculation and in the end, we have a close estimate about all the CO2 emissions that were produced to make this project possible. The calculator also says how many trees are working for us for one year and how many trees we need to plant in order to compensate for this mobility. Usually, I've done this a couple of times, it's around one to two trees per participant. That means after the project, no, like uh, in the end of the project, we contact the local authorities and uh, they give us instructions where and which type of trees should we plant. We plant the trees and this is a way to compensate for the CO2 emissions. Also in this uh, Green Tech uh, project, we can also find an online library uh, with classrooms and useful reading materials related to sustainability, fashion, energy, tourism, and sports. Also, we created a tips and tricks guide about green challenges. And uh, more information you can find about the first Erasmus Plus forest that was created in Amarante, Portugal on 2023. After the end of the project called Zero Waste. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and to present you our project GreenDex. Thank you so much. Uh, at uh, one of our recent packed webinars, we talked about the climate footprint, but also the climate handprint. And I think this is a nice example of, of how you understand your footprint, but you also uh, grow your positive climate handprint. And I think that's also what, Sarah, your project is about, is with young people or even younger children, I'm not sure. Can you tell us more about what you have been doing at Climatorium? Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, so thanks so much for inviting me in to participate in, in opening up the conversation about next generation, even though we've already spoken a lot about youth, which is amazing. Um, building a bridge between generations and also between sectors is something that is very dear to me, so I'm very happy to be here to present. And um, 
what I'm talking about today is two concrete uh, projects or events that we are hosting at Climatorium, the organisation in Denmark that I work for. And the one is Children's Climate Summit, um, and the other one is Global Youth Climate Summit. The Children's Climate Summit is targeting 10 to 13-year-olds, plus minus. Um, it's done through a positive and a playful approach towards climate change, very much to prevent climate anxiety. Um, we show the children how to work on solutions, and at the end we ask the children to develop their solutions, um, which is always engaging and uplifting um, because we see their creativity. And to, to come up with some examples, uh, one year the children developed a brown pizza box because pizza's around, so why should the box not be round and how much material could we save? Uh, and another good example is the weather turbine, where they've thought one total com product, which is a wind turbine, it's solar powered, and it's also a water driven turbine. Um, and I mean, these are not solutions that are meant to be implemented. Of course, it's in a, from a kid's kind of way of thinking. But I think it's very important that the way that we teach children to think solution focus is very, very important. Um, and also to include this design thinking, um, not that it's one person high up that has all the answers. We all together come up with the answers. Um, the other event that we're working on and with is the Global Youth Climate Summit. That's targeting high school students. Uh, that's the generation which is very crucial. And I think when we talk about youth here, I think it's very important to divide children and youth and what the age group is because the way we approach them is very different. Um, and the youth segment, and if, if to put an age, I often say uh, 16 to 24. It goes a lot higher and it can also go younger. But this is the generation based on research that if we don't change our habits for that generation, we're really troubled. The older we get, the harder it is for us to change habits. And we know to succeed on climate change, we need to change habits. Um, so how do we do this? Um, and we've worked and tried this out for a few years in... It's not easy, definitely not easy. Um, but I think it's very important that we work with this generation that it is working with a motivating factor rather than causing climate fatigue um, and, of course, also climate anxiety. And what I really feel in Denmark, and I think it's the same across the world, is that there's a lot of climate fatigue and it's very hard to enter this conversation with youth. Um, with this Global Youth Climate Summit, we connect youth across the globe and this year, we asked them the question, what is your connection to water? Uh, water is essential to all of us. Um, and with climate change happening, we also feel the impact of water differently. I mean, Denmark is maybe lucky. We don't feel it that much. We are low-lying, but we don't feel climate change happening that much, which I think we can also see in the way that uh, we approach with youth. It's, it's a little bit distant. Whereas other places, unfortunately, really see it um, right in front of them. So hopefully by connecting youth in this dialogue, we will open up a new point of reflection. It becomes less distinct and it becomes more closer to the heart uh, when we connect with people that are being affected. Um, and when we feel something through the heart, we tend to think differently. So this, what is your connection to water, is a way to inspire and to reconnect our resources and reconnection to nature. And it's an open invitation to everyone uh, here today also because this event, Global Youth Climate Summit, we're celebrating on the 7th of November. And, and the more youth across the globe that we get to connect, one is to share their connection to water through a video. The other one is to connect with us online on the 7th of November uh, through engagement and also through workshops. And hopefully in that way would be a little bit of a seed to how to, to work with youth because from my experience it's, it's definitely not easy, but we are on the right track. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I see our uh, director, Elena Bardem, has just joined us. But to leave you some time to settle, we will uh, give the floor to some final remarks related to the youth theme. So I would like to invite Francesco, who is working in DG. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. It's very nice to listen to you, to all your experience. I would like to contribute with what we have been doing uh, on the context of regional policy. So you probably know that the regional urban policy this week is, is the week of, the, of cities and region. It's about uh, implementing a policy for uh, sustainable and economic development in all parts of territory. And what we usually say, we believe, is that this is a policy for the citizen, but also with the citizens. 
And uh, I would like to share with you some uh, experience that we have learned. When we wanted to involve citizens, in particular young citizens, on a specific challenge, on a specific territory, we were addressing the issue of inclusion on territory which are mostly affected by the presence of coal industry and uh, in intensity, in energy intensity industry. So how make this a transition which is inclusive and just for everybody. So we invite the young people through a project which is called EU Teens for Green to participate uh, to, to the topic, to the issue, to bring them solution. I will not talk today about the EU Green Transition. You will find all information about the 70 projects that have been realized on the internet. There are three things that I would like to say that we learned through this experience. The first things that I think is extremely important is the importance of the bottom-up approach. What we saw through this project that uh, every young people is interested. It's not only the youth association, but also group of friends, in young individuals, uh, sometimes very young. We have the experience of 15 years old. With the help of the teachers, they provide some awareness campaign to raise interest of all children in the school. So bottom-up is really important to really in, in this uh, global challenge. The second thing that we learn is how powerful young people is. They are not simply a multiplier. We saw that uh, they are, first of all, they are able to manage uh, financial uh, envelope, 10,000 euro, and also able to reach out all people in their community, not only young people, but also uh, an employee, family, and so on. So really, when there is a global challenge, it's very important to reach out to everybody. And young people are extremely good on that. They can reach their generation, but also other generation. Because as some colleagues say, it's very difficult from Brussels to reach out to everybody. The third thing that we learn is that they, at the end, they say, OK, but we need to be involved. We need the citizen assembly. We need the feedback mechanism. We need tools. We need capacity. What does it say? It says that it's not only sufficient to give opportunity, but we need to create an environment which uh, mobilizes their capacity. So it's good to have a legislation, but also it's good to have capacity in the administration which is able to be a counterpart of this. And this will have, should happen at all levels. The results, the benefit of this is we gain trust. I has uh, in a recent uh, survey conducted by OECD, the only way to gain trust from citizens is to make citizens active participating in the challenge that we have. So young people have really important for challenges like the climate one. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have had a very rich discussion. We haven't had the chance to hear from anyone, but I think we are from everyone around the table, but I think we are nearing the end of our allotted time, so I will just encourage you to continue the networking uh, during the lunch break. Uh, I will uh, highlight a couple of colleagues who might be interesting for these chats to continue on the education and youth team. We have a tremor from JRC who is working on the, uh, on the Education for Climate initiative. And also one uh, question that came up often is the kind of support that you can get for the various projects. We have colleagues, I believe, from the executive agency who, who uh, are knowledgeable about the different funding programs and support. So feel free to pull the sleeve of any colleagues. And indeed, there's also Ashil, who uh, is the expert on the topic of energy communities that also came up uh, uh, under several topics. But to wrap up and to uh, give Elena the floor for her concluding remarks, I will just flag a couple of things that I took note of and also a couple of things that have come uh, through the Slido questions. We have discussed many different topics on uh, how citizens can engage with local authorities, uh, what is needed to make it not only a bottom-up process but a bottom-up and a top-down process because that's important for ensuring the follow-up. Uh, we have discussed how we can use uh, citizen engagement approaches to uh, step up uh, our response to new kinds of challenges, be it at the European level, for example, through the citizens' panels that the Commission is now integrating as part of the policy process, but then also on very local issues. And on the local issues, we had the example, for example, from Italy, where 
the, or from the Bauhaus projects, where the core is really that it is about the local environment, the local context, and all the climate responses are also about the social response to, uh, to the challenges. Um, we also talked about power. We talked about how uh, for often for authorities uh, it is important to share the power to be able to achieve the change, changes uh, and for, of course, all of us as citizens to, uh, to understand that we have the power, that we uh, have the agency, that we have the understanding uh, that we need to really be the experts of our own lives, what climate change means for our lives and what we can do about it. Um, these were also some of the questions that came through Slido. Uh, one was that how can I convince people to get involved? Another question is how can I convince the authorities to get involved? I think you have shared some of your uh, takes on, uh, on that. One is the importance of follow-up, one is the importance of inclusive engagement, and one uh, is uh, the importance of, uh, of showing why it matters to people. For example, uh, health was mentioned as one of the angles that, uh, that are really important to each each one of us personally. And I think with this, I would like it uh, uh, to leave it to Elena for any wise words. Elena ha has just joined us from another event taking place during the region's uh, week. Elena is a director in uh, DG Climate Action, responsible both for adaptation and resilience and for communication and, and stakeholder engagement. So uh, it would be great if you can share with you a few thoughts from, from uh, today or going forward. Thanks, Laura, and uh, thanks for allowing me to come and address you. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite communities, the Pact Ambassadors, and, and I see many uh, familiar faces already around the table. Maybe uh, a couple of elements from uh, where we are with the new political guidelines and the mission letters of the commissioner's uh, designate and the executive vice president's designate. We're in a place where... Um, the institutions are reflecting very deeply on the way we talk to the citizen and how we relate uh, to the challenges that we are needing to address through the European project. And if you look at Ursula von der Leyen's political guidelines, it's very much about preparedness, resilience and empowerment. And this uh, element of citizen engagement, local and regional engagement, is very strongly featured in the generic part of the mission letters. All the designates, all the new co co college members get a mission letter, which is their personal terms of reference. But there is a generic part of those mission letters. And in that generic part, I, I have not seen that before, and I've seen a fair few mandates, how strongly the commissioners are invited to go on the ground, to, to engage, to be present at local and regional level. And I think that talks volumes about the commitment of our president, but the incoming co college as well, to, to really serve and understand the people who matter in Europe, and that is the citizen. And I think platforms such as the, the Climate Pact Ambassadors the different missions, mission adaptation, mission cities, they are really primary off-the-shelf vehicles by now to allow us to multiply the messages, not just top-down from Brussels to the crown, but also bottom-up. So what we do need in the years and, and months, weeks going forward, is to, to work to facilitate uh, horizontal exchanges between different ministries that are involved, between different stakeholders on the ground, but also the vertical exchanges. Because multi-level governance remains a challenge. I know colleagues in Regio have lots of different capacity building methods and, and addressing specific parts of, of the society and really, but we need to get our ducks in row in order to match to the challenge that faces us with climate change mitigation, but also building resilience of our economies. Because climate impacts, that they're really happening quite fast. And we can't allow people to uh, fall into this sense of defeatism. There needs to be a solutions and action-oriented alignment. And I think the Climate Pact Ambassadors, you in your co roles and capacities with your respective networks, have a key role to play. Not 
as our mouthpiece. That's not what we're asking, but bringing to the table some of the different, even the non-consensual conversations, and telling us what the problems are. Because if we are as presumptuous in Brussels as we think that we can do this, steer this project to the right direction without knowing what concerns the citizen, then we're going to see you know, that the anti-European force is getting stronger and stronger. And that's not the business we want to be in. I think the EU can be strong, and it must be strong, at face of the global threat scenarios and challenges. Because when we work together, and we, when we work together with the citizen, we can really come to that. So it is about uh, education, awareness raising. It's about empowerment, empowering your, your local uh, networks. But it's also about equipping. And this is where the EU and the Commission can help. Providing with some uh, exchanges and platforms to facilitate this peer learning, different kind of uh, uh, good practice sharing, but also educating and, and explaining some of our financing systems that are there. And, and there are different uh, technical um, capacity building facilities in, in the, the reform DG, but also in Regio, etc that we can easily uh, provide more information about. Then the final thing about uh, convincing. Laura, you said some of the, how can you convince your local authority, how can you convince your partners, your peers? Um, listening is the first part of convincing. You, you need to understand what is it that concerns your interlocutor. So listening is the first part of understanding. And then we have to be more agile in talking in the terminology that matters to your interlocutor. So, so if you want to find traction and resonance, we need to become more rehearsed in addressing the, the concerns of that particular interlocutor. And I think we have a lot of uh, good ingredients and best practices for that. So moving forward, I want to see the climate pact uh, go strong continue working with us, helping us try and shape policies that actually relate and make sense to the citizen and, and uh, bringing us the, the problem cases as well. Because if we don't have the courage to talk about the problem cases, then we really uh, can't succeed and we shouldn't be maybe in this business either. So thanks very, very much. I, I uh, have heard about the good conversations throughout the day. And uh, I think the harvest will be very helpful in helping us design uh, next steps and policies as we move along. So thank you. Thank you, Elena. To close off, I will give you two pieces of homework. First piece is for those who are present here physically today, talk to everyone during the lunch break. The second piece is when you go uh, to your office or when you go home, and this is the only piece of homework for those who are following us online, go to the Climate Pact website and have a look at what you can find there. Because one of the inspirations for today's event was the set of citizen engagement tools uh, that are available on the Climate Pact website. And the idea there is that it is really a flexible set of simple tools that you can use to get started. And the important thing is getting started. You can get started by organizing a small climate walk. You can expand from there to a big peer parliament. You can make it a whole project. But uh, what we want to do is to give you some of uh, the ingredients and some of the, uh, some of the tips that you need to, uh, to do it. What we'd like to also share today is that in addition to the four tools that we have had online for several months now, we are preparing two uh, new ones based on uh, suggestions and demand from our community. One of them is around sustainable food, and it's about getting people together. Uh, around a meal, which is a great uh, way to get people talking as well. Uh, and the other one is a collection of what we call climate games, which are easy to use interactive activities that you can incorporate in various citizen engagement activities, again, to help you get started and uh, move uh, further along on this journey together. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming, and let's continue the exchanges.